Hello! A bit of a different video today and it comes from a Patreon request. Bob, who's one of my patrons, has a Insta360 X3 and he was having some issues using Insta360 Studio. This is the software you can use on your phone or on your computer to take that 360 degree stuff and either export it or edit it so you're changing the camera angles and stuff. Now it just so happens that I've also got an Insta360 X3. Uh, my wife and I bought as this as a sort of present to ourselves for Christmas. Um, generally though, I'm more about using it for underwater, so we're going to take this uh, snorkeling when we go on our holiday later this month, because uh, I keep apparently missing stuff on the GoPro. I think I'll take the GoPro as well, just so I can compare the two. But for Bob, he's sticking on his motorbike, he's sticking on a quad, and he sent me some video over, so I thought we'd go through some of the features of Insta360 Studio, what you can do with it and what you can't do with it. So uh, let's go. So just before we get in the studio, the first thing you want to make do when recording 360 videos is make sure you're recording at 5.7K at 30 frames a second, which both sounds like very high resolution and like a lower frame rate than you might want. But don't forget that we're talking about having two lenses um, trying to create a 360 degree uh, field of view. So it's, it's not as high resolution as you think. If that was just a single lens, it would be, but to, to bear in mind you've got your whole 360 view, it's, it's more like having a 1080p view. Um, if you look in your camera or on your memory card, you should get free files with every uh, video you take uh, when recording in this way. You'll, you'll have two of these vids, which is basically there's, there's one of these for each of the lenses, and then this LRV, which is a low resolution video, which is what the camera uses to generate the preview where you can look at it on the camera. It's very important that you don't rename these because when we try and import these into 360 Studio, um, if we use one of them, it will look for the other one. So you'll notice they've got the same name apart from one's zero and one's 10. So let's grab hold of Bob's video first off. I've obviously got this on my local files um, and I did notice it, it, Insta360 does a pretty weird thing when you want to edit something. It, um, if you plug the camera in and, and say import the, the file, it doesn't actually import it, it sort of works on it live on the camera um, and never actually gets on your hard drive until you sort of export it. So I much prefer having it local to my hard drive. So I move the files over and then work on them locally. Uh, and one of the reasons for this, I noticed on my Mac and I had a look at this and it seemed to be a not uncommon thing. My memory card got corrupted when I was working on it from the Mac. So I either get it to my phone via Bluetooth and then, and then push it onto the Mac or I take the memory card out and do it that way. But anyway, this is Bob's video. Um, and we've got the 360 view we can look at here which looks all a bit peculiar. And this is what's called the reframe, where we can basically edit and do what we like. Uh, your, your basic control series, you've got, uh, hi Bob, there he is. Uh, you can move the whole view around with the mouse. If you use the scroll wheel, you can zoom in or zoom out down to the sort of the tiny planet idea. And you will notice there's various degrees of um, distortion as you go back and forth, depending on the view you want. So at its most basic level, um, one of the things you might want to do is create a 360 video on YouTube. And the idea of this is people can actually watch the video play and sort of run around. So what you probably want to do is set your in and end points because Bob probably doesn't want to look at himself sorting out his quad. So we can just simply move along here. You see that we've taken off there. So we're on the ground there. So we can, that's our in marker. And then we're going to be looking for when it lands. So it looks like it's just come down here. There we go, we just play a bit of that. Oops. There you go, and that can be our out marker. And if you want to create a 360 video here, all you need to do is say export, and then by default, it it uses the reframed video at 1920 by 1080. If you say export the 360 video, you should see that swap over to uh, the sort of 5.7K and just say start export and that will start happening. 
Okay, so once that has exported, if you open that up and take a look at it, it'll look a bit weird. It's it's basically the entire thing at, at once. That that means you've got a good 360 clip. Now, if we just upload this to YouTube, which is what I've done here, you're able to play the video. Let's go forward a bit. Turn that down as so I can air, and then you can mess around changing the angles. You've got limited amounts of zooming in and out with the scroll wheel, but only if you're in full screen. Um, and yeah, you, even if you pause it, you can do that and just look where you want to, really. So if you just literally want to produce a 360 video and uh, have people scroll around on your own, your job is done. It's as simple as that. But what if you want to do something more complicated than just exporting the 360 view video? And, and what options do we have as, as well as the sort of reframing stuff? Well, let's go over here for starters. Um, what we've got in here is things called flow state stabilization and direction lock. And you can really see this in evidence. If we look at a bit where, let's say we, this is where we turn a corner just here. If we have a look at under that, under its standard control, I'm just turning the volume down, you can see that all looks completely flat. If we go ahead and turn flow state stabilization off, <laughs> you can see straight away that we're at a bit of an angle here. And there's little bits of uh, shakes and stuff. But generally speaking, it's, yeah, you can see the horizon is, is not flat for us. And sometimes that's what you want. The other interesting thing here is the direction lock that was on. When direction lock is on, no matter what angle we put the quad at, so let's say we want to look uh, out of the front of the quad, if I maneuver this round and then hit play, as we go around the corner, you will notice our direction is pretty much locked on to the front of the quad. So we're always sort of following where it is. If we take that off, you do get quite an interesting look from it. Uh, so if we put ourselves back at the front again and then hit play, you can see that as we turn around, the camera stays in the same place, or that our, our angle does, but the quad sort of rotates around, which I think is quite interesting as well. The only problem with direction lock is it applies to the entire project, uh, as well as flow state, so you can't have it off and on for certain bits, but you can replicate what direction lock does by um, changing the way it views dynamically. Down here, you've got the, the stitching you can see uh, here, we've got our stitch line. You can just see a little bit that's missing. And the stitch line is where the two lenses try and connect. And in normal, you can see it's worse. Bob, I know, has got the sticky lens guards on, and that helps it a little bit more. I've kind of tried to play with the calibration a bit to get it better, but I can't seem to do much with it on this one. That's about as good as it gets. Um, sometimes it's about changing the way the camera's mounting and stuff like that. But this this isn't bad. It's not it's not doing the worst thing ever, just cutting off this tiny little bit. You can just see the misalignment there. Uh, we've also got types of processing, which I thought was quite interesting. Color Plus seems to really up the saturation, although it does, does make for a nice sort of blue sky and green grass. We've got Clarity Plus that I do interpret as sharpening a little bit. You can see when it goes on, you can just see a little bit more detail on there and you can change the strength. We've got Motion ND. This is kind of like, um, it tries to blur the frames like you've got an ND filter on. It's better used when you're doing hyperlapses or time lapses where you've got moving things. And then we've got AquaVision 2.0 here. That, this is because if you're using the underwater housing um, as soon as you go into water, like one meter, the red color goes completely. So this times tries to sort of boost the reds. On my GoPro, I use a, a red filter, so it's really interesting to see how it's going to work for me. Uh, this is a, a bit boring. You can put a logo on that says Insta360, and project management means nothing. And then we've just got that bit. So I, I think on um, this one, I might might go a bit of color plus. See how that looks just make it a bit more vivid. So the, the basics of what you've got here is keyframing. 
what you do is basically add keyframes um, to your, your footage and then sort of move it as you go. So for example, if we wanted to start off like that, I would add a keyframe and I would say that's exactly how I want it. You've got options here to do different sort of views and things. And this is what it's set at the moment. You see, if we move this, we'll find it moving just a touch. So we're going to have it there. And if we were to play that from here, it would just go pretty much normal. And I, it would be the case of, oh, when we get here, I might want to sort of change the view a bit. So I would add a keyframe here, but I wouldn't move it there because if I then moved it, it would change it gradually as it went across. So I would play on for a few seconds. And then at that point, I'd add another keyframe. And this is where I'd say, okay, let's, let's move it into the, the interesting position we want, which let's go sort of more frontal look so we know where we're going. And if we then rewound our timeline and look to that, what we should find is we do a take off and then zooms around to there. And we can just carry on adding keyframes. So if I was going down there, and I want to add a keyframe here and then we'll move it on a bit to add another keyframe here because on that one, let's say I want to switch it around and see where I've come from. Maybe it's sort of this angle, something like that. And then we can just check that again. So we take off, we zoom around this way. And then as we carry on, we turn around to look behind us and stuff like that. And there are also, if we just zoom into the timeline a bit, you can, oops, where are we? I've zoomed in too much. You'll notice that we've got sort of what I would call keyframe pairs. So if we have a look here, we can actually do uh, a type of uh, the way you do the, the transform. So this is like just general linear. And then you've got uh, a slip in fade out. It's, it's kind of how the transition works between it. So let's, let's try to put one of those in and see what we get. So if we rewind our thing to here. It kind of changes the way it moves depending on that curve. Not, not particularly something um, I'm interested in from that point of view. And we can just carry on doing that. But another interesting feature of this editor is tracking. Can you see we've got this car just here? And if we click on this one called Deep Track and we just try and draw a little thing around there, let's see if we can track the car. So it's got the car, it's basically trying to track this along. And you can see the quad kind of in the way there as we're going, doing its own thing. It's going gonna, it's gonna to struggle around trees and stuff when things disappear. But it seems to do a pretty good job of uh, tracking things and people. It's got a fairly good little AI algorithm to do these sort of things. So that is a bit of car tracking. Let's just do a little bit more, let the car go around the corner. And let's stop it there. And then what we've got, if we go back to our view here and let it play, is we've got our kind of now weird move to go behind the quad. And as the car comes into view, what we should do is follow it. But of course, at that point, the quad sort of rotates around to see where the car is. So it's kind of a an interesting way of being able to track something whilst um, seeing a different perspective from the quad here. I kind of like that. We've got things like time shift. A time shift is a way of speeding up or slowing down stuff. So if we decided, ah, oh, this bit's a bit boring, we can just say, let's, yep, thanks for that. We can just zip through that really quickly. 
and that will like imperceivably go extremely fast that way. I think just before we do that, we'll add another another couple of keyframes here, and then move on a bit, and let's say here. Just change our angle again. Where are we? There's the front. And that way, we're just preserving things a little bit. And then as we go super zoomy zoomy, You can actually see the um, that ND motion is turned on there. Did you see the blurriness it presented? If we do it without the blur, it looks like that. The blurring looks pretty good in the speed ramp, I think. So that that little ND thing is is not too bad. Now the other thing you can do is is change the aspect ratio. This is per project thing, but this is in sixty nine. But you can change it to a little square, one one. 916 if you're thinking of posting this on a phone you've got 4 free and then you've got 235 one which is sort of your cinema scope type deal uh, 169 is kind of the normal thing we're used to there the thing you can't do with this that you can do with a normal editing program is say oh i want this bit and then i want to cut that bit out and then have this bit because insta 360 thinks oh no you must want the entire thing surely <laughs> why would you want anything different to do that, you will need a regular uh, editor. And you can do it in two ways. You could, We could go through this and we could export the file normally and then edit it in the editor to take bits out. Or we could export the entire thing, depending on your editor, as a 360 file to do it. If we wanted to do this bit as, as we've got now, and, you know, probably we'd put a, a bunch more moves in and you know we'd do it down to the landing stuff, we'd click on export and we keep it as export reframe video uh, and our resolution is unfortunately only 1920 by 1080 and we do the export and then we could go ahead and edit that if i wanted to edit that in final cut pro what i would say is export 360 video um, and to do this it pretty much ignores all these things we've done and then to get the best possible i'd say uh, export it as prores 422 and start export. You can see the file size we're talking about here is absolutely outrageously big. Uh, so there's there's nothing too bad about going as H.264 if you want because the, the file size is much, much smaller. Although this goes a little bit out of scope of, of what I'm trying to say about how to use the, the, the basic uh, 360 Editor Studio. And, and as I said, you just carry on doing that stuff. If you've got a more full featured editor you want to use, odds on you can use it. I use uh, Final Cut Pro. And what I've done here, I've taken the previous export that I've got, which is then recognized as a 360 degree video. And then what I can do is turn it around and change my field of view. And I can edit stuff uh, using slightly more complex controls, uh, using keyframes or changing stuff. And what I can do, of course, is go into the timeline and cut bits out and, and stuff. So I thought what I'd just do is, is take one of these awful uh, YouTube music library things I can find that's about a minute long and see if I can cut this against music to see how it looks. And I'm going to use this for that just because I can basically blade out bits of the stuff I don't want uh, and do it that way. But it's the same sort of process, but this is like more complicated. Uh, this is more user friendly and everything you can do here you can actually do in the Interfix 360 app on your phone although I do find it easier especially when dealing with like uh, the, the accurately timing to, to do it on the desktop but these are things you can do anyway let's have a look at how my video turns out <laughs>
Now, I think that was fair to say that was a little bit over the top. I was using every single possible effect to whiz around and, and do things, and uh, that would look pretty sickening if you did that. That was just kind of a demonstration for all the different things you can do. But I think if you're going to do this in quad flights, I think you need to keep it quite subtle. Um, I think I really love the, the exterior shots you get, either from the front or from the back, depending where you put the camera, and uh, it's worth getting a little extension stick just to give you a little bit more of the exterior. But I think it works best when mixed in with, you know, some regular uh, forward-faced camera footage uh, of you flying with stuff and then switching to exterior if you were going to do it that way. But, you know, that's all very subjective and each to your own. Anyway, that was my little uh, tutorial on Insta360 Studio and how you can use it. Hope that was helpful, mostly for Bob, but if you guys out there liked it as well, then good. I am glad. Anyway, that was that, and I will see you next video. Bye for now. Well, you've made it to the end of the video, so thanks once again for watching. If you like what you saw, then please consider subscribing. And if you really like what you saw, then be sure to check out the link to my blog for a variety of ways in which you can help support this channel.